Welcome to the Whole Tropic Psychedelic Integration Podcast. I'm Art Granoff at referenceastrology.com. Today we hear directly from Stan Groff from October 2011 at the Insight and Opening Retreat in Joshua Tree, California, led by Jack Cornfield, Stan, and Christina Groff. Please leave your comments below. explain why we think uh, we should do holotropic breathwork or work with uh, holotropic states of consciousness of some other kind. Uh, again, I'm, you know, I don't specifically emphasize holotropic breathwork, but I really believe in the healing power of these holotropic states. There could be shamanic uh, uh, rituals of some kind, rites of passage, it could be some uh, systematic spiritual practice within which it happens. It could be uh, support for people in spiritual emergency. So any, any form of these uh, non-ordinary states, what can we expect from it? Why, why would we do it? So I will say something about what I believe they can do for us individually, but also collectively. You know, if you look at the world today, it's not a very nice picture. And so, so is there any, anything in this process of working with holotropic states that could help us um, in this crisis and give us better chance for, for survival? So I'm a, trained as a clinical psychiatrist, so I started this whole thing by trying to find some more powerful way of um, healing uh, rather than talking you know, free associations, which in my own seven years of psychoanalysis, I didn't find a particularly transformative uh, or obviously transformative uh, procedure. So we see a lot of people uh, breaking out of depression. We see people uh, working through phobias, uh, releasing uh, what uh, Wilhelm Reich called character armor. You know, a lot of uh, pent-up energies in the, in, uh, the body. Uh, when there's propensity to aggression, to violence, you can certainly clear that by, by uh, finding ways of expressing that energy. Uh, today, after years of working with these states, I cannot imagine being a psychiatrist in an admission ward and somebody comes you know, it was a lot of aggression, and I would say, well, let's, let's give him or her tranquilizers. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, aggression is energy. So we say, you know, uh, where, is, uh, where is the mattress, and let's get two people, and, you know, let's get it out, rather than be sure that, that it's there, it stays there, and, and uh, that it doesn't uh, manifest. A lot of psychosomatic problems. We have seen people working through migraine headaches. We have seen people working through asthma. In some instances, what's called Raynor disease, when uh, you cannot get your, uh, your hands uh, warm, very, very cold hands. Uh, so there are all these uh, you know, psychosomatic pains of various kinds and so on. So that's, uh, that's one aspect, uh, something that you can expect from, you know, systematic responsible work with, uh, with these holotropic states. But then there is some much, much broader, much deeper uh, significance. And I use for this uh, discussion uh, this uh, tanka that you probably know. It summarizes uh, the teachings of Vajrayana. It's the Lord of Death holding the uh, Wheel of Life. And the Wheel of Life are six realms, or lokas, and uh, they, are, they have several functions. They are, um, you can say, to Jungian terminology, uh, you know, archetypal domains uh, that we can experience uh, as part of the dying process, but we can also experience it as part of our self-exploration. Those archetypes are there. You don't have to wait until you are dying. You can visit those states. And I mentioned that also the, the archetypal realm kind of forms and informs what is happening here. 
So you could find for each of those domains some kind of a, um, expression. I think Jack frequently talks about that one realm, which is the hungry ghost, if you want to uh, find out how it manifests in our world, go to Las Vegas. Uh, or, you know, the, the realm of uh, um, uh, these um, uh, jealous, uh, jealous gods. Uh, this would be something like Pentagon or similar, you know, similar institutions all over the world. Uh, the, the realm of the gods, sort of people living in, you know, in riches and very comfortable. Um, realm of, the, of uh, the wild animals. You can be brought up in a family where there is a lot of uh, violence. Uh, so that many, many of the animal impulses uh, are actually expressed in, in everyday life. There's also realms where um, uh, hell would somehow project into uh, the th three-dimensional world. Um, the concentration camps, for example, have been called hell on earth. It, all these you know, basic elements uh, have been really enacted there in, in real life. Uh, Christina and I went to uh, Hiroshima and nothing that we read about uh, Hiroshima really prepared us to what, what we saw there. Uh, this was all wooden structures, so near the epicenter everything just was evaporated, and then the rest on the periphery, it was all burning, and people were trying to save themselves, jumping into the river, but the river was boiling. They got, sort of, they got uh, boiled alive. So you know those images of Japanese hot hell. And was literally what was happening there was this archetypal domain somehow becoming part of, uh, uh, part of life. So anyway, these are the, uh, the lokas. The, you know, the deva loka, asura loka, uh, preta loka, nara loka, manaka loka. So those are the realms. But what we are particularly interested in is that center. We can see a descending and ascending path. And then in the very middle uh, are three animals. There is a snake, there is a rooster, and there is a pig. And they have symbolic meaning. But the snake, they're basically forces that keep us on the wheel and that are a source of suffering uh, in the world. So the snake represents aggression, the pig represents ignorance, and uh, the rooster represents uh, uh, attachment, desire, attachment, you know, uh, um, it's a, again a very important force that keeps us on the, on the wheel. Now, if you work with holotropic states, you get a chance to work is with all these three different uh, elements. In the original uh, Hinayana Buddhism, the idea was that this is a realm of suffering and you basically want to move out of here. Um, nirvana is uh, related to vata in Sanskrit, which means wind. So it's evanescence, it's blowing the torches of life, completely moving out of the samsaric world. In uh, Mahayana Buddhism, you have a different uh, understanding of this, that you can experience nirvana to the extent to which you can reduce the influence of these three forces uh, in your life. And so I would like to talk a little about what the holotropic states can do. So if you st start with uh, ignorance, you, know, you, can, you can, for example, um, regress into your childhood and you find out that some significant things, traumas happened in your childhood that still are seriously influencing your present life. Not only can you find out that these uh, problems are there because they were 
uh, repressed, they were forgotten, but you can actually work with them, you can change them, you can free yourself from that. Uh, you can uh, relieve your birth, and you can really bring the, uh, the emotions and the trapped physical energies into to the surface, and you can free yourself from that very, very powerful uh, imprint. You can experience something from prenatal life. But then you can go beyond that. You can identify with other people and get deep insight into them. You can identify with uh, members of other species. You can get insight into nature. You get information that you did not have uh, before and so on. Now, this is just collecting information about the material world. And that's really not the deepest meaning of the pig. The pig represents um, what's called avidya, which is a very fundamental ignorance about who we are and what it is all about. And that's uh, really something that the holotropic states can help us, because they help us to discover that there are hidden dimensions of reality that are extremely important in, in shaping uh, the fabric of the universe itself, but they are not um, uh, available, they are not accessible to an average person in the ordinary state of consciousness. You have to really be in a holotropic state of consciousness to discover things like um, the collective unconscious in its historical aspect, uh, the collective unconscious in this archetypal uh, aspect uh, to discover, you know, that there are uh, invisible beings, the archetypal figures, that there are archetypal realms that uh, you can experience and that play really an important role in that whole uh, cosmic game. Then uh, we can look at uh, the second one, which is the uh, which is the rooster, which is uh, uh, the desire. Gandhi said, you know, there is uh, enough in the world to satisfy everybody's need. There is not enough to satisfy everybody's greed. So we, we're dealing with this, you know, very fundamental uh, human uh, drive, which is it's never enough. You know, where, is, where do we have enough money? Where do we have enough power? Where do we have enough fame? So there is a tendency to pursue some linear goals, feeling uh, some sense of dissatisfaction with who we are, uh, what we have available, what our resources are, and then our mind sort of creates a certain image of a more satisfactory future, and we set ourselves up on a, for a journey uh, to, to achieve that goal. And then uh, two things can happen. One is uh, the goal is simply more too ambitious. You don't achieve it. And then you would have the feeling that your dissatisfaction comes from the fact that you couldn't achieve that uh, corrective goal. Uh, the second thing that happens is you get there and uh, you wake up uh, in the morning and you have your diploma or you have your million dollars or, or uh, you know, position in the world or whatever, and you find out that not a lot has changed in your basic life feelings, basic feelings about yourself. So uh, the thing is, what went wrong? Well, the goal was not ambitious enough. You know, uh, a, a medical degree is not enough. You have to get a PhD degree on top, or a um, million dollars is not enough. If you have two million dollars, that that would really transform life. Uh, Joseph Campbell uh, talked about, uh, and Christina mentioned it already, getting to the top of the ladder and finding that it's against the wrong wall. <laughs> and basically, we cannot get enough of something that we don't really need or ultimately don't even wa want. You see. Um, so this, no matter what you achieve in the material world, it simply does not uh, give you what you expected from that. Um, Werner Erhard said uh, in one of the S training, he said, 
you know, the psychologists train uh, rats, uh, and uh, they put them in mazes, and at the end of some of the corridors is cheese, and, and in some others, you, there's no cheese at all. He said your average rat will find very quickly those corridors where there is cheese. He says only people are not like that. We keep going to the corridors where we have found out in the past there ain't any cheese. So now what is, the, so what is this drive, you see, to, to always wanting something, something more, something bigger? Uh, now a significant uh, part of this, beyond any kind of biographical programs that you might have, is the fact that we carry uh, in our psyche like unfinished gestalt of the birth process. For example, if you, if you do the, the faster breathing, many people quite quickly find themselves in the birth canal. Now, if, if uh, you know, an hour of faster breathing is enough to get you there, to some extent you live in the birth canal in everyday life. Your sort of part of you is really here, part of you still is uh, connected with the, with the memory that has not been finished. So what it basically creates uh, is, a, is a feeling of dissatisfaction that can take many different forms. And then uh, what the existentialist called auto-projecting, self-projecting happens. You create some kind of an image of a situation where, where circumstances would be better, life would be great. What do you need? Money, you know, diplomas, power, fame, and so on. And then you, you know you would uh, set yourself in that, in that direction. Now, if you don't go inside and you deal with the material per se, which is processing uh, the, uh, the birth memory, and you just sort of act that drive out in some kind of projects in everyday life, no matter what you achieve is not really fully satisfied that, that craving for something else, for something uh, for something bigger. There is a story about Alexander the Great, who, you know, um, I'll tell it a little later. So anyway, so that's, uh, so this is the situation. You can, you can uh, release a lot of that by bringing the, uh, the memory of birth to the surface. You express the emotions. You express the, the um, physical pent-up energies. Uh, and that can significantly uh, improve somehow uh, how you feel about yourself, how you feel about uh, the world, the ability to be in more in the present moment and uh, kind of enjoy what is available uh, rather than always wanting something that is not, that is not uh, available. It changes somehow the general strategy of life before uh, there was that drive into the future towards some kind of a future uh, project. So that uh, the idea was to, uh, you know, compete with the competitors, uh, remove the obstacles, remove the, um, or, or fight the enemies, and achieve that particular, uh, that particular goal. Now, if you now free yourself from that drive to get out of the confines, of uh, the birth canal, people say life has become more like uh, martial arts. If you, if you do martial arts, you kind of see what energies are uh, around you and then find automatic way how to respond to them. Even better uh, image is uh, something that uh, Ramdas mentioned years ago in, in Prague at a conference. He says, uh, the life becomes more like surfing. You see, where am I? Where are the energies going? How do I fit? Oh, this way. Okay. And now we are changing. We are going this way. Um, you cannot say when you are surfing, you know, now I'm going to go left. This would not be a very good outcome. <laughs> so, um, so now people who who are able to move their life strategy in this direction, that it's more like martial arts or more like surfing, they actually find out 
that they can achieve more with less effort. And they discover also something quite extraordinary that synchronicities start happening that seem to be helping them in a accomplishing that particular project. You know, the right kind of people show up, even the money or the right kind of, a, uh, of an information. And uh, there's another characteristic of this kind of a strategy that it will satisfy us, but it also serves a larger purpose. It's not uh, ex sort of exclusive that you achieve something at the expense of others, like in uh, competition and so on. Uh, so this is, this is basically uh, the, what's called Wu Wei in, uh, in Taoism. It's called the creative quietude or doing by being rather than having a, a concept of what we want to achieve in the, in the world. So going through the psycho-spiritual death-rebirth process can really you know, significantly move you in that direction but there's enough of the, uh, of the ego uh, element left. And that seems to be coming from the transpersonal level. I would just refer to uh, Ken Wilber's um, work where he uh, talks about um, uh, the, you know, the Atman project, how... Um, our true nature is divine. He uses the, the concept from perennial philosophy. And somehow in the process of reincarnation, we lose that awareness. We sort of forget about it, but not completely. There's some element within us that's telling us we should be somehow much more uh, than we are. Now, as long as we are in uh, the physical body and uh, we operate with the limitations of the of the Newtonian world, we can never accomplish, we can never sort of uh, reach the dimensions of our true nature of divinity. We would have to become it all or be it all to really uh, connect with our true nature. But there is a way of having an experience of our own divinity, the experience of uh, Atman Brahman that you can achieve in an unordinary state of consciousness, and then when you come back in your everyday world, you would have that meta framework when things get really difficult, you now have a sense of who you really are and what it is, what it is really about. And here I tell this, this Alexander the Great story. Uh, the story is about his conquest. You know, he comes from Macedonia, takes all the territories all the way to, to India. He came as close as you can to the fulfillment of the Atman project. He was even called Divine Alexander. So when he arrived in India, he, he heard about this yogi who had the gift of seeing the future. So he decided to pay him a visit. And he would come there and, you know, the yogi sort of sitting, you know, in meditation. And he just, you know, very rudely kind of interrupted him and said, I'm Alexander the Great. I understand you can see future. And uh, the yogi kind of nods. And Alexander says, okay, can you tell me if my conquest of India will be successful? Now he has appetite for another subcontinent. <laughs> and the... The yogi is kind of sitting, just barely opens his uh, eye and says, all you will eventually need is about six feet of ground. And just clo closes his eyes. So that's like the end of the greatest Atman project there is. So anyway, so those are the, but those are the levels um, of experiences that can somehow help us to, to deal with that kind of... Uh, dissatisfaction that we have with, with uh, ourselves and our life, where part of it really comes from the fact that we, we have not really been born. And we, we got out anatomically, but uh, you know, a lot of the experience is still part of us. It's not, it's not finished, it's not fully processed, it's inexperienced experience. So that can sort of loosen that and then 
uh, then the, you know, the most powerful remedy is really having that experience of, of oneness with the, with the divine and then recognizing that in some sense it is you and it is you know, this, all of us, each of us. Okay, now let me look at the, at the last, uh, which, is the, which is the snake, okay, which is violence. So where does violence come from? You can look at human history, and to a great extent, it's history of violence and greed. Enormous amount of suffering, you know, created in the history of humanity. Now, the current science gives you uh, the explanation, which is, you know, we are part of the animal kingdom. We are sort of highly developed animals, and, you know, aggression is a very important force in nature, so we, you know, carry significant part of it. So all these things like the naked ape, the uh, territorial imperative, uh, Paul McLean's idea of the triune brain that Wes described so beautifully, you know, the reptilian, the mammalian brain and so on. Uh, but there's a problem with this kind of uh, explanation. Um, which is um, really well expressed in uh, Eric Fromm's book, which is called The um, Anatomy of Destructu Destructiveness. And what he shows there is that human violence is really different from animal violence. It's even worse, because we are violent without any good reason. You know, the animals would be violent if they need to hunt, they need to feed themselves, or they might be sexual competition or defending territory. But you don't find anything comparable like, to what happened in the Stalin archipelago or the Holocaust or the, the things that the Chinese did in Tibet. So Eric Fromm called this uh, uh, human violence malignant as compared to just the the uh, aggression that is part of nature. Life feeds on, feeds on life. So what, what did we find about this extra uh, element of, of aggression in, in human nature? Uh, the first uh, approach to, to explain that uh, came from Dollard and Miller and other people, which started a whole line of exploring childhood. The fact that we have extremely long period of dependency on, on the parents, unlike you know little turtle, who sort of hatches and, and is is able to to exist on his or her own. So we have this long period of uh, dependency. We have security needs. We have needs for satisfaction, and if there is frustration of these basic needs, it generates. Uh, it generates feelings of uh, aggression. So this would be related to our traumatic postnatal uh, history. But then we discover some additional, much more fundamental uh, sources of aggression on the perinatal level. If you realize that um, we are through a process which could have been hours, you know, one hour, two hours, or days. There are deliveries that last like three days and situation where the life uh, of the fetus is seriously threatened or there were people who were born dead. They had to be resuscitated. Tremendous amount of pain and anxiety, suffocation. And it generates powerful aggressive response, kind of a biological fury. We could take a uh, volunteer to the swimming pool and hold the head underwater for a couple of minutes. You would see kind of, uh, you know, experimentally induced aggression. I mean, the person would kill when they cannot uh, cannot breathe. Sometimes people who are being rescued, drowning, you know, uh, take their uh, take their uh, rescuers uh, with them. So there's this enormous amount of aggression generated that doesn't have anywhere to go. The, the child cannot scream, you know, cannot fight, cannot uh, 
move, escape from that situation. So a lot of these uh, emotions and physical feelings are generated and they stay in the system. The, the little crying that happens um, after we are born is uh, trivial as compared to what would be necessary to process that kind of an experience. So what we see in the breathwork, for example, in psychedelic sessions, in spiritual emergencies, people uh, relive, uh, it's not even correct uh, description to call it relief because it's really experiencing it fully for the first, uh, first, for the first time. Uh, there's a wonderful paper that we referred to in our book uh, by Ivor Brown, an Irish uh, psychiatrist, which is called The Inexperienced Experience. It's people asking why reliving a trauma should, should be healing? Why shouldn't be re-traumatization? And so, you know, there are all kinds of reasons. The reason that you are there now as an adult person who has different uh, resources than the, the uh, child had. But the important part of it is that you are experiencing this fully for the first time. Before it was kind of recorded in, in the body and in the psyche, but it was not really fully brought into into consciousness. So we were born anatomically, but we were not born uh, emotionally. We didn't really arrive. So that is, a, you know, that is an important, significant uh, part of the, of the malignant aggression that we, that we carry. But then we also have the archetypal realm. So there is a lot of aggression that is associated with the archetypal figures with archetypal uh, motifs. You know, there are death gods of, of uh, different cultures. There are uh, sort of violent archetypes. There's the apocalypse, you know, the uh, Ragnarok, the, the doom of, of gods. Uh, we could have past life experiences in which there was a lot of violence. We were involved in some uh, battle and so on. So. This, this uh, aggression is present in the psyche on many different levels, part associated with the traumas that we experience postnatal, uh, postnatally, then the aggression that was generated in the birth canal, I didn't have anywhere to go. Uh, remember that, that engulfment picture that I was showing where the, she was turning into a little devil? There was like this, the swallowing, and then she was actually turning into the devil. So uh, there's a lot of the uh, uh, aggression on the, uh, on the perinatal level, and then we have uh, also aggression as part of various uh, archetypal motifs. Now the good, good news is that all those levels are available in holotropic states. You can really reach the aggression on those levels, and you can work with it. You can, you can uh, express it with, uh, with support. Okay, now, uh, when I wrote a book, Realms of the Human Unconscious, uh, which was my first book, I described the perinatal matrices, and what I mentioned there is that when uh, your self-exploration reaches the perinatal level, that for many people it tends to open into the collective unconscious, and suddenly you would be experiencing yourself as being involved in some battle, in some war, in revolution. So, uh, let's say as you are in, this, in the second matrix, you would be experiencing yourself in, uh, in a prison, in a torture chamber of the uh, Inquisition, in the concentration camp, being the victim. You get to the third um, matrix, and it will be, if there's a battle, you would be also uh, the warrior or the perpetrator. You would go from the role of, of being the victim to being the perpetrator and then also watching, watching that whole scene. So I described this. And I got a letter from a man called Lloyd de Moss, D-E-M-A-U-S-E who is a journalist, uh, a psychoanalyst, and he's a, f a founder of a movement called Psychohistory, Application of Depth Psychology to 
basically politics and history. They would be, uh, you know, psychohistorians would be studying the childhood of presidents and military leaders and try to understand their decision making from their individual history. Or they would study child rearing practices and link them to the nature of revolution. Child rearing practices in Tsarist Russia and the Bolshevik Revolution and then child rearing practices um, before the Civil War and then comparing uh, the, uh, the two uh, revolutions and how they are related to the child rearing uh, practices. So I got a, uh, a letter from Lloyd de Moss, and he was very excited about this material. He said that it really validates his own historical research. That he had become interested in the situation prior to wars and prior to revolutions. What do the demagogues do? To, to mobilize civilians, to turn a population of peaceful civilians overnight into these killing machines. You know, what is the mechanism? So by the time he wrote me the letter, he had studied 17 situations prior to these kinds of events. He studied the speeches, he got into the archives, sometimes he got drafts, uh, where there were even things that didn't get into the speech, or there were doodles, you know, little drawings on the side. Anyway, he found out that, that uh, all these speeches had one common denominator, which is the, uh, the leader, the demagogue, would be using imagery of biological birth. You see, the enemy is closing in, has, his, uh, has our throat in the grip, is squeezing last air out of our... Uh, lungs. Uh, we don't have enough space, we are crowded. Uh, um, Hitler used to say, wir haben nicht genug Lebensraum, we don't, don't have enough uh, space, to, space to live. And then promising the solution also in terminology of birth. But there is light on the other side of the tunnel, and I will lead you there and we will all breathe freely. The promise of free, free breathing is like a common denominator in revolution. We are oppressed, we are choked, and you know, we uh, need air. And what we, we do something so that we can breathe, breathe freely uh, again. Okay, now snake. Again, I talked about the two types of snakes. One is the, uh, the poisonous uh, snake, uh, the viper, which is the uh, imminence of death, but also um, beginning of initiation. This could be seen as, a, as an initiation process, psycho-spiritual death rebirth. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, in Pompeii, there's this beautiful villa, Villa Dei Mystery, and the frescoes portray a Dionysian uh, ritual, the death rebirth ritual, and it begins with a bite uh, by a viper, by a poisonous snake. And of course, the boa constrictor is very perinatal, swallowing the prey and looking pregnant, and then also crushing. So the, the idea here is, uh, that the leader is not uh, a kind of a big um, uh, paternal figure, but more like a garbage collector, that we sort of, we carry a lot of these perinatal energies in, uh, in our body, in our psyche, and that it happens sometime that this, these are um, activated on a very large scale, so a certain kind of atmosphere develops of, of threat, and the leader is somebody who has very close access to these perinatal energies, and he steps out and then formulates it for people and expresses it in terms of uh, you know, perinatal language and promises the solution in perinatal uh, terminology. 
Um, now, the interesting question would be, why should the perinatal energy sort of rise at certain times? And uh, you can complement it with Rick Tarnas, with his book, uh, 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 Cosmos and Psyche, where he shows systematically the same kind of a planetary transit at the time of wars and uh, revolutions. He really went through history and showed that, uh, that this these times are associated with like, uh, you know, Saturn, Pluto, Mars uh, transits. So, yeah, just the last thing that I would, uh, would say, that he believed that we should learn this perinatal symbolism the way we learned uh, the Freudian symbolism. You can't fool people now by Freudian symbolism in advertising and so on because we, we know it and that we should know the perinatal symbolism that when the leader comes and says, you know, we are choking there after us, they're squeezing uh, you know, air out of our lungs. You say, this is not a good reason to go to war. You know, you should, should do some inner work on this. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm finished, Jack, so uh, it's all yours. <laughs>